so we're going to move to the third um, and final high leverage teaching practice that we're going to talk about this evening. And this one, hold on one second. Mm -mm. There we go. Um, and this one is actually guiding learners to interpret authentic texts and leading text-based discussion. So the first piece to that is um, understanding our use of the word text, first of all. It doesn't have to be print material. And the graphic got cut off a little bit on the right, but it includes things that you listen to, things that you view, anything that is written typically by native speakers of the target language and intended for native speakers of the target language to read or listen to or watch, um, as opposed to something that is written for the purpose of supporting English speakers to learn this language. Um, that's what we mean when we're talking about an authentic text. And the key aspects to guiding learners to interpret these texts and then what you'll do as you lead these text-based discussions with your learners starts before they even look at them. Um, it's really important, and literacy research shows us this, it's really important to engage learners in activities before they read, before they listen, or before they watch, um, especially activities that, that require prediction or that help them make connections like what Adam explained right at the beginning where one of the first activities they did was talk about their own water use. Just doing that gets those brain synapses connected and realizing that ready for that next component of the lesson where they're going to learn something about water usage. Um, prediction activities have the same effect. So a piece of this high leverage teaching practice starts before they ever see the text or video or audio. And then we're going to guide students through main ideas and as they become more proficient, details, in some cases at first it'll just be really key details, and then as they become more proficient, they can dig deeper and deeper and deeper and get more nuanced um, understandings out of these texts. Another really important piece that I think sometimes doesn't happen as much as we would like in language classrooms is engaging students in opportunities to make inferences from this authentic document and also to guess meaning from context. Because ultimately, our learners are not supposed to know every word and they're never going to know every word. What they really need to walk away with is the ability to use context to help them bridge the gap when they encounter words that they don't know. Um, and sometimes before they even do that, they need to do that quick evaluation of, is this word, is this something I have to know in order to move on with whatever it is I'm trying to do? But if it is, how can I use contextual features to help me um, understand this? Because they aren't always going to know. Then we're going to move, once we've done those things with the text, we're going to move to interpreting and discussing test, texts. So these become the things you do after students have read or listened or viewed something. And they include a lot of activities, but the kind we're going to focus on today is leading text-based discussions. Um, and you'll, you'll be doing several things here. Those discussions help you and the learners um, demonstrate that the learners have comprehended what it is they needed to comprehend out of that text. These discussions prepare and support learners to engage in ongoing conversation about the topics that these texts talk about. And as a result, we're going to ensure that the room itself is structured to foster communication um, so that it's easy for our students to communicate and engage with each other. I think you've already heard a couple times tonight how important you know, it is to have these students interacting with each other. And I know myself, I, I had the ability to do this, thankfully, and the flexibility at my school site. Um, my leadership allowed me to change my room setup to be tables. I got rid of the rows of desks because I wanted them to communicate with each other all the time. Um, but also we want to, going back to something we said earlier, we want to make sure that errors aren't the focus of our interactions with learners. So when we're looking at leading these text-based discussions, we want to focus on meaning. And we know that they're going to make some mistakes when they try to explain to us what they are getting out of the text or what ideas that raises for them or what questions they have as a result. And we're going to, if they were able to make their 
statement understandable to me, I can rephrase it for my learners, for the rest of the learners or do other strategies, but this won't be the time that I'm going to focus on the errors. We'll have other opportunities to refine their language um, structures and vocabulary. And then this process ends with providing closure. So for example, you might elicit summaries from the students um, and from what they shared and kind of after many students have spoken and you've done these text-based discussions, you can use a variety of strategies and tools to have them individually kind of reflect and summarize on what some of the key points were that they heard that day during the text-based discussion, for example. So we're going to move on to our questions for Adam and Rachel about um, these, about this particular high leverage teaching practice. And the first question um, is going to Adam. And the question is, what is the role of authentic text in project-based language learning experiences? Well, this is a huge topic. And you know, Nicole, as you're saying, there's a, a huge range of, of texts, whether or not the, they're actual uh, written texts or uh, uh, videos or, or other ways that, that's, that the target language is used in an authentic context. And we don't use textbooks in our, in our Chinese curriculum at all, except for some extensive reading. And we're, we're always trying to curate content online in the form of YouTube videos or articles we find online, um, uh, visuals that we might find. So, for example, with the Water Project, we found a series of, of visuals introducing uh, ways of conserving or reusing water that UNICEF put together and translated in Chinese, and they're visually uh, enticing because they use these fun colors and cartoon images, bigger characters, smaller char characters to highlight uh, interesting concepts, and these are another entry way for, for uh, getting into those things. But even if you want to do something more complex, we will often will just show a clip of, say, for example, a, a movie or a, or a soap opera that may show, uh, say, for example, a conflict. And then you get to a critical point. Even if the kids don't know every single word, they can follow along the general story. And then we stop and say, what would you do next? How would you resolve this, con this conflict? And then that, that uh, offers a, a point of, of inquiry for the students to start discussing amongst themselves about something that they might find uh, interesting there or, or put themselves in the shoes of the character or, or something. Um, and then finally, even in just going into actual written text, we, we want our kids to be able to read longer uh, essays. We'll often find authentic texts that are from the news. We may edit them down a little bit because uh, advanced and superior level Chinese writing can be really, really hard especially for kids who are just at the intermediate level. So we'll, we'll take out some of the more difficult language and then scaffold it by highlighting colors of, 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 the, of um, say, the new vocabulary that, that would be new for them or um, using a different color to, to, to highlight uh, connective structures so they can see um, patterns in the sentences. These sorts of things that, that will help them uh, to dive into a dense uh, uh, text of Chinese, given the, the challenges that, that reading Chinese uh, brings along. So these are just a few, few ideas to share right, uh, for the start. Yeah, we're actually going to, I love that you brought that up because um, next week, one of the high leverage teaching practices will dive into um, looking at grammar through authentic texts and, and doing exactly that, finding texts with patterns so that the students can actually see the pattern in action multiple times. And um, that sense of, you know, I've looked at some authentic materials when I want to use them with my learners. I also have had to mark for them, for example, maybe I don't want to remove pieces necessarily because I want, I, I want them to realize that this is the whole authentic text, but I'll highlight for them which pieces I want them to pay attention to. Um, and that allows me to do things like sometimes, as you were referring to, there will be some really like difficultly phrased details that, that weren't necessary. They do provide additional information for going further in depth for the proficient reader, but for the goal I had for my students at the time, they don't need that information. So finding ways to make it clear to our students what it is they need to focus on and what they can safely ignore or take a look at but not worry about it if they don't understand is critically important. And I also love image rich texts. I'm a huge fan of infographics for my novice learners. Um, 
because it really helps them dig into some concepts that really work wonders for critical thinking, even when they're only functioning at the word level, because infographics provide that huge amount of visual support with kind of limited use of words um, so that you really only get the keywords you need, which tend to be the words that I've been working on with my learners. Um, Rachel, what would you like to add regarding the role of authentic texts in project-based language learning? Um, yeah, I mean, like you guys have mentioned, they were pretty central to my project. I mean, um, you know, we did a whole evaluation of children's literature and I brought in a bunch of children's books. I think that was helpful, even though my students are adults, I think, you know, they knew our audience were children. So it felt okay to be looking at children's books. And I think it was helpful, of course, for the visual support that they have. Um, with Portuguese, we are a less commonly taught language, so often I'm relying on authentic text just because there's a lack of material in general. Um, but yeah, I think also in PBLL, you're looking at real world problems and real world issues, so it just makes sense that you're going to be using authentic materials and real world texts, like Adam mentioned, um, with the water. So yeah. Um, I think that's how I've used it, um, especially with the children's books. Yeah, I agree. I think, like you were saying, if we're going to do real world tasks, we need to give our learners multiple opportunities to interact with real world documents. And they don't all have to be complicated, um, but that's going to be critical to their success as well. It also gives, for example, if you're going to do project based language learning with novice learners, we have to remember that novice learners by definition function at the memorized chunk or phrase level and word level. And as a result, the other thing they do well is imitate. They don't create very well in the language. That's, that's actually the hallmark of intermediate. So when they try to create, that's when we see the struggles and the difficulties. So that importance of showing them, you know, authentic resources that, that mirror the kinds of things we're going to expect them to produce make it really manageable for them to understand what they're aiming for. Um, as well as going back to what Adam said before, having those clear can-do statements and targets um, you know, for them so that they also have a sense of what it is they're expected to do and what they can safely leave aside. Yes, yeah, just to briefly touch on one project I did, not my big book project, but a smaller um, alphabet book project with a novice class. And that was really, they were each just working on one sentence and they worked with their partners. They had conversation partners in Brazil. So they would um, use a cognate. So it's a similar word in English and Portuguese, starting with the same letter. And they were just producing on the sentence level, one sentence. And they worked on the English sentence, the sentence in Portuguese, and they um, ended up, well, we're still finishing it up because there were more letters than students, but they're working on um, an ebook that, a bilingual ebook. Awesome. Nicole, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'll just jump in one more time. I just want to share with everyone that uh, for our eighth grade students at Case, I, um, I and my teachers completely stole Rachel's idea of her, of her book creation project. And we have a similar book creation project where our eighth graders go and review some Chinese stories that they read when they were in first and second grade. And that's kind of a fun experience for them to go down to the, the, the little kid's library after so many years. And then design a, a, their own children's story in a similar way where they can use Storybird or Book Creator or, or create their own physical book, which we bring to a Tibetan region in China um, and share with Tibetan students who are learning Mandarin when they're in kindergarten. And uh, it's a great way for, for our kids to, 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 sh uh, to share their own um, creativity, but also to learn how do I tell a story in a way that a little kid will understand it? And what is a story that I can tell that a little kid will, will actually want to read? And again, you have to think, we're working with 13 and 14 year olds, sometimes the boys will write these stories where someone a monster will come and kill everyone or like no 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 don't do that your friends think that's hilarious but you're writing for a five-year-old he doesn't want to read that and so we we have to have them think about about these aspects about who is your audience and so these are things these are skills these are real world skills that, that go beyond uh just simply the idea of reading a, a children's story as well um but but in, in doing so they're going back and rereading their authentic children's literature that they experienced from from before 
deeply. And it also shows them when I do a similar thing with, um, in one case, we actually study fairy tales. And most of our students, at my school at least, most of them read fairy tales when they were little. Um, but we, we then revisit them. And when they're older and they revisit what they read or heard when they were younger, you're actually able to deconstruct it so that they're still experiencing the same story and the, the memories that they have and appreciating that. But now they're able to deconstruct it as an older learner now and look at the features and exactly why it is things are done the way they are in children's books, you know, why the pictures are so big and there's one sentence, you know, um, there's a use of repetition often, or, you know, you start looking for characteristics. So they're also learning about this content area, which in this case is literature and specifically children's literature. So that's really important. I'm going to, um, give this next question to, I just forgot who I did the last one to. Adam, did you go first on the last one? I believe I did, yes. I think you did too. Okay, so we're going to go to Rachel. Um, how do you find, when you need authentic resources that support students' inquiry in project-based learning, I get a lot of questions about this, so I kind of wanted to throw this out to both of you too. You know, how do you find authentic resources, especially for learners who are functioning in the novice range? What are some of your strategies when you are about to start, you know, a new experience and the theme of that experience? What's your approach to finding multiple resources? Yeah, for me, like I mentioned, since both of the projects that I worked on were focused on children's books, I again use children's books as a great example because they do provide the visual support, the language is somewhat simplified, there may be repetition. Um, you know, simple one or two words, um, one word books, there's even sentence books for very novice learners. Um, I believe it was Stephen Chudy, who I know is here, um, during his podcast that he mentioned um, even simple things like lists, texts, maps, you know, all of those kinds of things can be much more accessible um, and sort of support learners who are beginning or novice in those cases. We want to look at items that people who speak this language as their native language actually use in their daily lives that mirror the functional range of our learners. So, um, and I'll, I will actually do searches for things like, for example, if I want to do something on geography, one of the things that I'll do is I'll actually go, you know, try to think about at what grade do I think um, French children learn about the geography of their own country and I'll guess and usually even if my guess is wrong Google will still point me to the correct grade level and then you open that up and you find the activities that are actually intended for native speaker children but that um, actually help them to build geography skills and awareness and the content vocabulary and so on. So I know that that's another approach that I have used, not just on that topic, but on several topics, but also just looking like at what kinds of lists would be used in this particular topic area. So can I search for lists like that? And if I search in the target language, um, what kinds of charts, what kinds of statistics, what kinds of other items, I don't whether it's menus or maps or whatever it right, is. Right, or yeah. yeah, like you know, shopping lists. Right, or right. Even depending on the horoscopes or you know, <laughs> depending on what you're doing. Depending on the topic, Adam, what would you like to add? Uh, so I would add uh, really the same things that, that we teach our kids to search, search, search in Chinese, and if they find interesting graphics that have uh, have text in it, please do use them. Uh, again, we're, we're always teaching them make sure that you are correctly documenting uh, anything you might use in your presentation, having the, the URL embedded so people know where it came from. But we also try to do some things that are a little bit more creative. And, and uh, this year, we started actually having the kids experiment using Google Earth 
Earth and uh, um, uh, Google Cardboard for a 3D experience so that they can kind of cre create a, a space that they would be able to describe things um, about, that they're learning about in China, or in particular, for even for the Guilin program, we had the kids come back and say, introduce something for your families or other kids here at Case about what the, the Guilin experience was like, um, whether it's a, a place we went to in town or what the neighborhood, what our school was like, or uh, going to the, the terraced uh, rice paddies outside of town, what that experience was like, and create that with a narration and some text as well, so that it, it's, it's a, they create more of a collaborative experience in, in doing these kinds of searches. I just expand on that because I know not everyone might be familiar with that. So um, there are, so Google Cardboard is basically just a, it's a small headset made out of cardboard that you put your phone in and then, I wish I don't happen to have one here, I have several at work, um, <laughs> where you put your phone in it and if, depending on what you're looking at, if it's, if it's something that is optimized for a virtual reality experience or for a 360 degree photo, it, it, tra it takes you there. It's virtual reality. You feel like you're really there. Um, and so learners can both explore, um, they can go places beyond the classroom using this technology. Um, and depending on the technology that the learners have access to, I know, for example, there's a great resource called Google Expeditions. I'll just let you all Google that. Um, but Google Expeditions um, has several expeditions, not just around the world, but also like to the space station and underwater coral reefs for environment and so on. Um, but if you're using droid devices, um, not iPhones, unfortunately, but if the students are using Joy devices, they can actually create their own expeditions, including the little information cards that would be used by the person leading the expedition um, and others can join. And on their headsets, they don't see the information card. They just see the pictures and the images and the student or person leading it has actually the little information cards to, about what they wanted to say about each image that they're directing their viewers to. Anyway, that's just, it's an amazing way to bring people to a variety of types of places that would be relevant to the work that we're doing. Um, so how do your learners use authentic materials as they, and Adam, I'm going to let you continue because you actually touched on this. How do your learners use authentic materials as they make choices regarding project topics, project activities, and even the products that they will ultimately create as part of their projects? So our students actually have to do a bit of research. So again, referencing back to the water project, if, if a team decides that they want to look at, at, uh, at uh, um, recycling water as their topic, then they may have to go to research, well, what are methods of recycling water? This is, can be a little tricky because by and large, there's not that much information in Chinese on that topic. So we ask them to say, find what information you can. And if you say, if you find an infographic about building something, then their project is to go ahead and build it themselves and then create their own video where they have to 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 translate what they what they found out into Chinese and that's the process as they go along uh, in some ways but for but for other kids they are able to find other um, statistics sometimes that they are able to 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 show about uh, uh, problems about water conservation in different areas of the world so they're actually doing a little bit of analysis looking at for example droughts in uh, Singapore and, uh, and Israel as well as California and then different uh, methods that they may use for that so it, it really the sky is a limit it, it's up for the, the kids to decide what they want to do and this is where the, the voice and choice comes in although it, it might it might need a little bit of help of work to find materials that are in the target language or finding ways to translate materials that if you can't find uh, anything that's in the target language yeah that's a really good point and Rachel to ask you to quickly just add if you have one quick thing to add to that so that we're going to turn it over to a few questions after. um sure yeah i'll just try to go really quick so um in my case the authentic materials or the books were sort of an inspiration for their project and they actually made a guidelines which i based my rubric on for the overall project so that's a separate rubric from the one i talked about not to confuse everyone um, so that actually became sort of how their final project was graded. So by them looking at the criteria of what was a good children's book that helped them build um, 
the criteria that I would use to give them their final grade over the project and also to look in a critical sense at the children's books and not only look at what was there but what wasn't there in terms of representation of the characters um, etc so yes yeah, thank you. I really, really like that sense of that the students through their own evaluation of the of samples of the product they were going to create, they determined what the criteria was for successfully completing the work they needed to do.